Hey guys, my name is Ryan Central and welcome to another Borderlands 3 video. I was really lucky to go to the gameplay reveal event that happened yesterday or a couple of days ago at least um, and I got about 5 hours total of game time in on some of the new Vault Hunters. In this video though I went to reddit both r slash borderlands and r slash borderlands 3 and basically asked what do you guys want to know about the game soon as I had the opportunity to play it. I was sent about 200 questions, a lot of them were the same, so in this video I have dialed them down to the main questions that I can most definitely answer so to give you as much information about the game as physically possible. We'll be talking loot changes, weapon changes, the story, the worlds, and a little bit of information about stuff like Endgame. Before we get started though, we do have a giveaway going on at the moment. For a copy of Borderlands, all of the details are in the comments below. Super easy to enter if you haven't already. So the first question I wanted to start with was who did we get to play there are four vault hunters in the game much like previous borderlands games um, but the two that we got to play in this event were amara and zane we didn't get the opportunity to play flak or mose at all nor did we get any form of new information but for zane and amara we basically found out everything in terms of abilities and skill trees and all of that good stuff the second question is a bit of a weird one to start with but it's really important with how it sets up the characters and their skill trees and it's basically is there any form of weapon or element affinity. In previous Borderlands games let's say for example Mordecai if you wanted to play a sniper character in Borderlands 1 you would play Mordecai. You wouldn't play Brick, you wouldn't play Roland, you'd play Mordecai for a sniper rifle or to use handguns because two of his talent trees were focused around those particular weapons and increasing damage with them. From what I've seen and what I understand there are no forms of talents for Zane or Amara that increase damage for assault rifles or shotguns or sniper rifles, you know specific weapons. It seems that Borderlands 3 are moving away from that and if you say pick up a sniper rifle that you want to use you can use it on any of the four characters from what it seems. Um, there are certain elements of element affinity when it comes to going down talent trees you have a lot of freedom to customize the way that you want to play, which I think is a really big thing, but it does set up talking about abilities and weapons and stuff like that for the future. So weird question to start with, a bit of a long one, but a really important thing to bear in mind, in my opinion at least. So we'll start with talking about Amara. Who is she? Well, she is the Siren character in Borderlands. Each of the Borderlands games uh, have one, at least the main Borderlands games at least. She was really cool and fun to play. But of course we need to talk about abilities. How many abilities does Amara have? She has three in total. We'll go over what they are in a second. But it's important to know that you can only pick one at a time. You can't run uh, two abilities with Amara as an example. You pick one of the three that are about to mention. These abilities are as followed. The first ability is Phase Slam, which is where you slam the ground, fairly obvious, you do damage to those around you in an AoE, and you also knock those enemies up into the air. The second ability is Phase Cast, where you send an astral projection forward, dealing damage to those in its way. It can also travel through at bits of cover at least, it was a bit inconsistent from my testing, but it's a really good ability to sort of hit targets at range, and there's plenty that you can do with that ability which we'll go over shortly. The third ability is Phase Grasp, which is basically Mai's ability in Borderlands 2. You grab them and lock them up in the air where you can do a lot of follow-up damage with your normal guns. But as I said, you can pick one of the three of these abilities to run at once, but you can switch between them willy-nilly. You don't need to respec or anything like that. That was another big question. You could just go into your skill tree, pick a different ability. It might be on cooldown if you just used it, for an example, but generally, you could do it straight away if you want to. The next question is what are her skill trees and what are their focuses? This is another video that I want to do uh, some other time basically going really in depth to what the skill tree is. But we'll start with a brawl skill tree which has the ability face slam in there. A lot of the talents are reared towards close quarters combat. Not specifically shotguns like I mentioned but you might have talents as an example that increase uh, or give you bonus damage when you're close to the target. The closer you are the more damage that you do and that's pretty much the tone of what Brawl can offer as a skill tree. So if you want to run shotguns, be really close in, have that survivability to just last a little bit more, maybe even increase melee damage, then Brawl is the skill tree for you. Mystical Assault is all about increasing the action ability damage that Amara can do. It might be just increasing fire rate of your gun after you've used the ability, giving extra damage when you use ability, reducing the cooldown. But it also has a passive thing called Rush, which is something that you build up by doing 
a certain element of damage, killing enemies. You start getting stacks of rush, and then when you use your ability, it consumes the rush stacks that you have, but it increases the damage uh, that your action does. So you basically try and get as many stacks of rush as you can, you use your action ability, it'll do a lot more damage. So this skill tree is all about increasing your action ability damage. And finally, Fist of the Elements, this is all about element damage. Fairly straightforward, again, not a specific one in mind when it comes to increasing element damage, but that's generally what the skill tree is loosely based around. As I said, we'll go into more detail some other time. But now let's go over Zane, who is the second character that I got to play. He is an Irish assassin, is a very rich guy, kind of like Batman he's been described uh, in previous sort of iterations and descriptions, I suppose, but he's a really sort of cool character and is a very cool Vault Hunter. Again, Zane has three different abilities. They are as followed. You have the Barrier, which is the deployable that you can throw down on the ground. The second ability is the Sentinel, which is a drone that you can send out and it will do damage to nearby enemies. And finally, you have Digiclone, which sends out a Digiclone of yourself that will do damage and sort of take a bit more of the threat from the enemy, basically distract them and do a little bit of damage. But the interesting thing to add is it's not as cut and dry for Zane, the first thing that he could do that's interesting is equip two different abilities at once. However, he loses the ability to use grenades when he equips two abilities, if that makes sense. It basically takes up that button on a controller or a keyboard. But also each of these abilities that I just mentioned, when you hold down the button or press it again, it will do something else. As an example, the barrier, it's a deployable, you place it down. However, if you press the action skill button again, you can pick up that shield and run with it. It shrinks in size and the damage that it can take, but you can pick it up and move with it instead of it being placed on the ground that you can't move it at all. For the Sentinel, pressing the action button again, uh, if you have an enemy in your crosshair, you will point to it and the Sentinel will attack that target and you'll see a little UI on screen. And for the Digiclone, when you press the action button again, you will teleport to where your Digiclone was placed, so you can swap places with them, and you can keep doing this again and again and again until the duration runs out for the Digiclone. Much like Amaro, what are his skill trees and what are their focuses? Undercover is more about mitigation more than anything, sort of increasing resistance, being able to use your barrier for different things. Freezing targets will instantly start recharging your shield. It's more about keeping yourself alive than anything. A good portion of the Hitman skill talents are kill skills, where you, in short, kill an enemy and you will gain increased fire rate, increase the cooldown of an ability when it's online, its duration basically. It's all about keeping that momentum and being able to kill enemies as quick as possible. And finally, double agent, a big focus again on that Digi clone. You can go into a lot of depth here. But seeing as I was only level 10 to 15 when I played this, I didn't really get to test this out as much as I would have liked. But looking for the talents is quite interesting, but they're the main breakdowns, mitigation, kill skills, and then your actual ability, the Digiclone, and just getting as much use out of that as physically possible. The next question is a really important one. Are there any 1.1 talents? And this is really unique for Borderlands 3. It's a brand new thing called Augments. And what these are, are these sort of 1.1 talents in the game, but you equip them there's almost like moddable things that you can add to your loadout. Let's use this as an example on Zane. You have the Sentinel, but if you look at the Augment Winter's Drone, it changes your primary weapon uh, damage from the Sentinel to cryo damage, freezing targets. So you can use this to freeze targets, maybe spec around increasing damage or decreasing duration of shield regen, stuff like that, if a target is frozen. You get what I mean? So you can use this, you can change it around, but each of the different augments have different slots that they can fit. For Zane, as you can sort of see on screen, you have the arrow-shaped ones, so each of these augments can go into those slots, two for each ability. But for Amara, as you're seeing on screen, they have different shapes. You have a hexagon, you have an arrow, and you have a diamond. And as you can imagine, some of the augments are arrow shaped, diamond shaped, hexagon shapes, and they can only go in their specified shapes. So it means that you have to sort of pick and choose very carefully what augments that you want to run. It's a really cool thing that I wish I could deep dive into a little bit more, but as I said, because we were level 10 to level 15, we didn't get as much time to really play with the talent spec and there's no way to respec either, which was really frustrating. Was there any new information on the other Vault Hunters, so Moe's and Flack? The answer there was unfortunately no, but we did get so much information, more so than people may have been expecting, with Amara and Zane, and it was, you know, really good fun to play them, really learn how these characters tick and play. The next section of this video, we're gonna talk about loot. The next question, of course, is 
what is new with it. And I'll be honest, not too much. They haven't really uh, reshaped the wheel when it comes to Borderlands, but they didn't really need to in the first place. But there are a few changes. Does loot work any differently to previous games? The only major change that was in there is that weapons and shields and grenade mods, class mods, they all have like gear levels now. And this is really interesting. It's only really used for a comparative tool more than anything. Because another question is, how much of an impact do gear levels have on weapons? Is it like Destiny where you can only get into certain content by having a certain gear score level? And the answer there is no. It's literally just a tool for you to easily and quickly at a glance see the difference between two weapons that might have mixed stats to see objectively which one is better than the other because they have a high gear score. Other than that, it has no effect on the game whatsoever. So don't be worried that it's gonna turn into Destiny or anything like that. That's not the case. Just gear scores in there so you can easily see weapon A is better than weapon B. What are the rarities when it comes to loot? It's much like a typical fashion. You have white, which is common, green, uncommon, blue which is rare, purple epic, gold is like legendary or orange is legendary. But there are rumours that there's going to be uh, rainbow rarities as well as of course pearlescent which will no doubt be in the game. Well we didn't see any of that. But again they haven't really changed too much when it comes to loot but for guns it's a bit of a different story. What is new with guns? Guns in Borderlands 3 feel a lot more focused around the manufacturer and each of the manufacturers have different styles of weapons that are easily established i guess would be the sort of way to describe it who are the manufacturers for this game well we have jacobs maliwan dal tdr tog hyperion atlas vladoff and finally a new one children of the vault which are like the crazy bandit weapons from borderlands 2. what are the traits well i'm going to go through this as quick as possible dal weapons allow you to toggle between different alternate fires which i'm showing you on screen for the most part it's choosing between uh, automatic or semi-automatic or like a burst fire kind of mode really generic and straightforward vladoff is similar but it changes the gun type as a whole for example you can have an assault rifle press a button it turns into a grenade launcher you can flip it around and do some really cool stuff there atlas is based around auto targeting you first fire like a tracker tag that's going to find the enemy then you can basically aim your gun up to the sky with your normal bullets, but they will hone in on the target that you tracked to begin with. So it's like homing missiles or bullets that you can run. Hyperion, fairly straightforward. Similar to previous games, the longer you shoot, the more accurate these weapons get. But also you have a little bit of a shield, as you've seen on screen, where you can sort of protect yourself a little bit. Tog, it's explosions, of course it is. You have normal ones that explode on impact, but also you can alternate between a different mode that fires sticky bombs that do more damage the more sticky bombs that are attached near a certain proximity. Jacobs, you know, typical vanilla Jacobs, does a lot of damage, especially with critical headshots or whatever, but also bullets can bounce off walls and do a little bit extra damage. From my testing, some of the weapons didn't necessarily do this, so it might be a case-by-case -case basis. Maliwan, the elemental gods, you can change between two elements on each of the weapons, which we'll talk about elements in a second. But you can change from like corrosive to radiation or fire to shock very easily depending on what you're fighting. TDR, when you finished with a TDR weapon you previously just threw it to the ground and you would instantly get another one. Now these weapons can bounce around and explode, they can grow legs and start chasing after people or they can turn into fireworks to home in on nearby targets. And finally Children of the Vault, these are bandit weapons, there's no magazine size, you don't reload but you can overheat these weapons if you're not careful. They do use ammo though, but you don't have any form of magazine size, you don't need to reload, and for the most part these are just the stupidest shit weapons, like they're ridiculous. The next question is who makes what? In previous games there would be certain elements of, let's say Hyperion not making rocket launchers, Dal not making shotguns, is that the same? Because a lot of people have been saying right now that each of the manufacturers, it seems like they make all the different types of weapons. And I would agree it seems that way, but I think at this point it's impossible to tell. But I'm inclined to agree that each of the manufacturers makes any form of weapon. Maybe not like rocket launchers and stuff, but who knows really. We didn't get enough sort of time to experience all the different weapons, but it seems that way for sure. Finally, when it comes to guns, is there a refill all ammo option? And the answer is yes, you could do this from any form of ammo vending machine. And the next question is, can you pick up lost loot? 
yes you can on Sanctuary 3 which is the main sort of hub ship that you're on there is a vendor that throws you your weapons that either you forgot to pick up or they dropped in an area where you couldn't get them so it's a lost and found basically it's a postmaster so really good if you lose a really good weapon that you can't get your hands on questions about elements what's new with them again not really much a lot of them work in the same way as last time but it raises another question which old elements are returning basically all of them cryo included you have shock corrosive fire cryo and i believe that's it because we do have a new element which is radiation which acts a lot like slag in previous games but also when a character dies that's been afflicted by radiation they will explode and any nearby enemies close to them will be afflicted by radiation too and it will pass along so really good for AOE build. What's new when it comes to the UI? Well, you've been seeing it on screen, so you can you don't really need me to answer that. You can see what's different. It's a lot sharper, there's more bits and pieces on the screen, but not too much majorly different. But you can certainly tell that it's a new Borderlands 3 experience. Questions on movement. Is movement any different? And the answer is yes. You can now vault, you can now sort of skid along the ground. Feels very much like Destiny Apex style. And again, goes on to a question, how does it feel? And the answer is amazing. We only got to play on console, which as a PC player was really frustrating for me, but I can't wait to be able to really move around and get into the groove. The movement of this game just feels so much better. I'm really gonna struggle going back to Borderlands 1 and 2 uh, after this event, now that I've played it. It's ruined Borderlands movement for me because it's that good. Some questions about story. What's the general story of Borderlands 3? We're not going to go into spoiler territory, but you are a vault hunter trying to find loot from the vaults like in previous games, but you also go head to head with the Calypso twins that are going around to try and find these vaults too. Not for the loot, no, because Tyrene, the female of the twins, has the power to siphon energy from living things. So she wants to kill the monsters that are in the vault, such as the Destroyer, take their power, become a lot stronger. We could talk about lore implications and speculation some other time, but that's the general gist. What characters from previous titles are in Borderlands 3? It's a very big question that uh, a lot of people have been wondering. You can see some of the other trailers. You have like Maya from the second game, Lilith, Mordecai and Brick in the first. Characters like Hammerlock, Moxie, Ellie, Marcus, I guess just go watch the trailers and see if you haven't already. But the bigger question is, where are the characters that weren't in the trailers? Where are characters like Tog, Krieg, Gage? Where can they be found, if at all? And I don't have too much information to share there. Some of these characters are coming back. I spoke to a developer and they gave me some initial, like, yeah, we will see some of the characters that weren't in the trailer at some point. But they did also say that some of these characters we won't be seeing in Borderlands 3. They want to bring in new characters, of course, and they can pick and choose who they want to bring into the story. So there will be elements of characters not being brought in. But they may be for future DLCs, what they also said. We'll have that interview on the channel at some point in the future with any luck. What about the world? What's different when it comes to world building in Borderlands 3? And it's more that these worlds feel more like hub worlds, like in Destiny 2, I would say. Like the EDZ is an example, you sort of get plopped in there. There's loads of main story missions to do, but lots of side missions that you can do too. And finding rare bosses that you can kill to try and get loot. It felt very much more like an MMO experience to an extent. And you could tell that they put a lot of stock in to try and make the world feel more alive and dynamic. And they did a really good job of that. But there's also a lot of new places that you go to, specifically new worlds. How many new places? This is a question that I couldn't get answered. I tried my hardest, but I would say it's safe to assume at least half a dozen uh, new worlds that you can try out. No doubt more being added into the future. Where are the new places? Well, if you look at the gameplay, you can sort of see different worlds. They're very clearly uh, not Pandora. But we got to experience Promethea in the gameplay in the background, which is the world where Atlas Corporation is based, which is where Reese is from Tales of the Borderlands. So there's a lot of story stuff going on there too. But you also have this sort of like swamp bayou kind of place. As well as like an Asian themed world, they may be the same world, I'm not quite sure, but you can definitely see where isn't Pandora or Promethea in that case. Where do we go that's old? Well, Pandora, of course. No doubt a lot of the story is still going to be focused around this world. So, of course, we'll be there quite a lot, I would assume. This is a big question. What is the end game like for Borderlands 3? We don't have any form of specifics here. Um, we do have some more information on the question of can you replay missions? And the answer that I got from some of the developers, again, in an interview that we'll talk about some other time. Generally, yes. 
Some of them you can do, but they wanted to make it clear that there is a lot of story progression and the game explains why you might be replaying a mission, why you might be repeating yourself uh, instead of, you know, like a lot of games like Destiny or World of Warcraft or Anthem, whatever, a lot of these games you are redoing the same content over and over, but the game doesn't narrate or tell you why in the story that you're constantly killing one person, you know? So they wanted to make sure that they were doing that in Borderlands to quickly recap what we said in that interview. But again, if you want to hear that, do let me know and I'll be sure to put it on the channel. But the end game, Borderlands was definitely made with end game in mind. That was what I was told. The narrative, of course, is going to be fighting the Calypso twins. That will be your leveling up experience. Maybe you kill them at the end of your story. Maybe not. But the game will move and progress into end game with a narrative and explain what you should be doing and why. This game, I think end game is going to be incredible. I've heard only good things, nothing concrete, but this is a game that's going to have a terrific end game if they can get it right. And considering how confident Gearbox have been, I think they've got it in the bag. Is split screen going to be in this game? Yes, couch co-op of course is going to be involved in Borderlands 3, as well as offline mode, which is another big question that people have been asking. Was the stream version of the game the full version? Like was it the final build? And of course no, it was just a specific build that we could play from level 10 to 15, we couldn't do any more than that. Boss battles. Okay, so I had to sit down with a lead designer of bosses, which I thought was quite interesting for an interview because why would they have a lead designer of bosses and sort of Randy Pitchford touched on this. Bosses are such a big aspect of Borderlands 3. There are more bosses in this game than any other. Mini bosses, just named bosses in the game. And of course those big encounters that require mechanics. One interesting thing that I was told is that I asked basically as a YouTuber, will people be making raid like tutorials on how to beat certain bosses and stuff and they said oh yes definitely so do look out for that again that interview will be on the channel fairly soon but i was so excited i had to tell you that i guess post launch content is another big thing too and it breaks down to is there going to be dlc like in previous games randy pitchford said yes they're currently sort of working on it but of course the focus is mainly for the launch of the game what about Seasons? Seasons is something that we've known for Borderlands 3 for a little bit, and it seems that they're going down the Diablo route. We don't really have much information, but if it's like Diablo or Overwatch when it comes to their seasons, over a certain period of time, you will log into the game, get certain like loot, you'll be put onto a leaderboard to be the best of Mara play when it comes to the loot that you've got and the stuff that you've managed to achieve. And each season, you can reroll a new character and do it all again. So it's a really good way to keep longevity uh, in the game as a whole. Is there a room where you can show off your loot? Yes, you can do this on Sanctuary 3, which is the main hub ship, as I mentioned. And this is a place where you can put all your legendary loot on the walls and just basically show it off to any audience or friends that you may have. Uh, because there are elements of you hosting games, if your team is on Sanctuary 3, they will probably see the weapons that you have on the wall. Can you also show off boss kills? Again, yes. Hammerlock has a room on Sanctuary 3 where you can show off the heads of some of the bosses that you've killed in the world. Again, no doubt a thing to show off exactly all of the cool stuff that you've managed to do. So finally, customization is a big aspect of Borderlands. What is there? Well, in previous Borderlands games, you have heads and skins, which are certain things that you can use to customize how you look. But of course, you also have uh, echo devices where you can change the UI to an extent, um, and also emotes where you can see the chicken dance done by Amara. Everything else you're seeing on the screen, in case I forgot any more that I felt were worth mentioning. But does that mean are there any microtransactions or loot boxes or anything like that? Nope, apparently the answer was no coming from Randy Pitchford from the event, so that's all good, you don't need to worry about that. But there is also stuff like golden weapons and trinkets, which are little customizable things that you could put on weapons, uh, like maybe like a small Marcus bobblehead, like the first Borderlands game. I think that's when you can expect to see those kind of areas. Another question that kept coming up is character dialogue. The character that you're playing, do they speak in a similar sense to pre-sequel? And the answer is yes. And this is something that Borderlands Dev spoke to me about and said people really liked that, so they wanted to do more of it. So they have taken good elements of pre-sequel and moved forward with it. And it's really good having your character Amara and Zayn talk. It just gives them so much more personality, it makes them so much more interesting. And because of that, I think it was a really good thing to add. But in terms of other quality of life stuff, the world feels much more alive 
alive and dynamic and because of that you have npcs running around with you you have um lorelei running around helping you out uh you run around with zero and lilith in some of the gameplay that we saw uh they will fight alongside you you can revive them if they get knocked down i don't even know if that's possible but most importantly they can revive you if you get knocked down not only the main cast but also stuff like atlas soldiers can revive you and basically the world just feels much more alive and you feel part of something bigger whereas I guess Borderlands 1 was a more isolating experience when you're playing through it so this was a conscious decision made by Gearbox and Borderlands to make sure that the world could feel dynamic alive with the addition of your character talking as well as NPCs being out in the world alongside you as opposed to staying in a hub area and not going there. I guess any final question did I have fun of course I did it was sort of a weird couple of days you know going away for a three day trip traveling halfway around the world to get here um, it's very surreal and I'm very tired but uh, it was a once in a lifetime kind of opportunity I'm very much glad that I got to come here and I'm hoping that I'll be invited out to other opportunities to play Borderlands 3 in the future so I can make other 50 plus questions that were answered videos in the future so I had a lot of fun it was really good but they are all of the questions that I can answer right now. I don't know anything else about what the level cap is, um, what is there going to be crossplay between Epic Games and Steam. We don't know that information just yet, but I'm sure we will do eventually. If there are any questions that I didn't go over that I could possibly answer, let me know in the comments below and I might do a follow up to this. Sorry if this video was a bit long and you were expecting something shorter, but I just wanted to answer as much as possible in one video. I hope you enjoyed it. Some really big information came out of the event, so I'm really happy to be able to share that with you. Thanks for watching, be sure to enter the giveaway if you haven't already. Take care, and I'll see you soon.